Dogs make the best companions for humans. This podcast aims to help make humans better companions for their dogs. Welcome to the Baru Podcast, a modern lifestyle podcast for dogs and their people. I'm your host, Charlotte Bain. I've been caring for other people's dogs for more than 15 years. And while I've learned a lot in my career, I definitely don't know it all. So I've collected an ever-evolving roster of amazing dog people, and I learn new things from them all the time. Hi, you guys. Thanks so much for joining me for another episode of the Baru Podcast. In today's episode, I'm chatting with Dr. Lindsay Went about her unique and personalized approach to elevating the health and wellness of our pups. One of her many specialties is helping our dogs that suffer from anxiety find a calmer state of being. And in her practice, she integrates Western and Eastern veterinary medicine with food therapy and other healing modalities such as sound vibrational healing, Reiki, and even crystal therapy. We chat about what anxiety may look like in our pups, how your dog's gut microbiome may be playing a role in their behavior, and how she personalizes her treatment plan to each individual pet. So let's listen. First, I wanted to thank you for turning us on to the ozone therapy shampoo because my dog, as you know, suffers from like super skin allergies and we have tried, I swear to God, every natural shampoo out there and several medicated shampoos for the, in the course of like his 14 and a half years of life. And we have only found a medicated shampoo that worked and it was drying his skin out. But since I switched to this ozone one and I'm not plugging, I have get no say in this ozone therapy <laughs> shampoo. I'm just saying <laughs> I get no money for this. It is, it is tremendous. Like he, uh, his skin is soft. His hair is soft. The allergy spots are like way better. So I don't know why it's magic, but thanks for that. And so you we are talk very about- welcome. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that a bit later, but yeah. first, um, I wanted to jump in and talk about you a a little bit because you um you've been a veterinarian now for what about a decade is that exactly 10 years mm-hmm. okay so what uh, and you offer so many different modalities <laughs> for health and wellness um from allopathic medicine to even like uh, sound bath and reiki which i love um so uh, i wanted to just jump in quickly and talk about kind of your journey i like to hear why people got into working with animals because it's the journey is a little bit different i think for everybody but there's definitely some similarities there Definitely. So I am very grateful, I think, to start. I was one of those people that I always knew I wanted to be a veterinarian. There was never a question, never anything else that came into my path that called to me to that degree. I think part of that is probably I grew up with a Briard. So they're a type of French sheepdog. They're not too common, but uh, my dog was nine months older than me. And so she really was (laughs) my best friend. I absolutely adored her. And I think that the strength of our bond just helped cement, I think what I already kind of came into this world intending to do. And so that really, I just, I'm so grateful that things lined up how they did. And I started working as a technician when I was 16, like right the day after my 16th birthday, I started working in a hospital. So initially I actually was attracted to exotic and zoo animal medicine. So I worked with a lot of exotics as a technician. I used to work actually with animal actors. So Oh. Everything. Yeah. Everything from tigers and bears, you know, hoofstock, large primates. So wow. really it ran the gamut, which was very interesting. But in terms of getting to the point where I had to choose for my career, what do I want to focus on? Right. I ended up focusing more on general practice and emergency medicine because I felt like I wanted to be able to support pet parents out there as much as I could. And while I love exotics, taking those sorts of jobs can definitely take your life, (laughs) your life choices away from you. I mean, it's, you can get taken all over the country, all over the world. So I wanted to be able to have a foundation in Los Angeles. My family and my husband were here. So things just kind of worked out that way. Um, And then really I, what I noticed, because I moved out of emergency medicine over time, stayed with GP or general practice. Um, So for those that don't know, basically your general practice veterinarian is the one that you go to for vaccines and skin issues. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. your primary care physician, if you will, for your yeah. pet. It's like, you, it's like your, your primary person. Exactly. Physician. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. 
Um, but what I found is I'm very detail oriented. <laughs> and so I take that approach to all the patients I work with. And so I would develop these long standing relationships with clients and with their pets. And then we would oftentimes get to a point in their disease where I didn't have anything else to offer them within mm-hmm. my conventional medicine toolbox, if you will. Um, I am lucky that I went to a great school. I had a phenomenal internship experience. So I feel like I had almost maximized my education in that realm, short okay. of going into a specialty practice. Right. But I, I felt like I was failing them when I would get to the point that I couldn't offer them anything else. And a lot of times they did end up having to resort to making end of life choices, which Mm. that's also something that I've been assisting people with since the beginning of my career. So I've been doing at home end of life transitions or euthanasias as they're Mm -hmm. commonly considered my entire career. And that's something that's I've always held very near and dear to my heart. And I always will, because it's such a, a gift that we can give our pets, our, right. you know, our loving family members that are there for us every day. So being able to allow them to transition at home where they're comfortable and they're not nervous about being in the car, or being in the vet hospital, it just, I feel like it's that last thing we can do to really make sure that we advocate for them from beginning to end. So right. I, I really started finding myself becoming frustrated just in general and, and, almost opening my mind up to if something else comes to me that allows me a path to be able to explore things in more depth or offer people more options, I'd love to do that. And then it just so happened that my own dog (laughs) who was a rescue. Mm -hmm. um, So she, when we rescued her, she, I actually met her when she had all four of her legs, but one had been badly broken. She had a pretty traumatic past, but um, we got her when she was nine months old and I had dabbled in having her undergo acupuncture and physical therapy because she was a tripod at such a young age. And I knew that I was very concerned about any sort of joint disease that might develop. And so I had dabbled in that a little bit with her having other practitioners service her because I didn't have that training, but then she was actually diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease, which for Mm -hmm. those that aren't familiar Mm -hmm. is basically like doggy Crohn's. And so she is a very sensitive dog. She's a lot like me. I think yeah. a lot of us have found <laughs> As that. As is my dog. Are, my exactly. dog is so much like me. <laughs> yep. They really are. And so yeah. she would, she was not responding to conventional medicine. And I had her under the care of two different specialists. None of us could really figure out how to manage her properly. And so I, at that point in my career was undergoing compassion fatigue, which is probably a whole sure. different conversation that yeah, I'm sure yeah. I think you guys have already touched on on this podcast, but it's really common in our it's profession. And yeah. It is. It's a huge issue. And I also started experiencing caregiver fatigue, which is Mm. something we don't talk about a lot. And I think it's important Uh. for pet parents to know that you're not alone. So there's a lot of us that deal with chronically ill pets, whether it's Mm. skin disease, intestinal disease, cancer, orthopedic issues, and it does wear on you energetically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I was getting to a point that I had nothing left. I would come home at the end of the day after work and it was the struggle for me to take care of her, let alone myself, because I prioritized her. Yeah, And I really just pushed myself to find other options to try to better better her health care at that point. Yeah. And that is really when I started a deep dive into holistic modalities. So I started with acupuncture for her. And I thought initially, I always thought of acupuncture as, okay, it's great for, you know, dogs with arthritis. Right. That's really what most of Mobility us think of. stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And the more I looked into it, I mean, it is beneficial for everything. And yeah. we'll, we can definitely touch on that, but yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so powerful. And even as a human, I've yeah. been going to an acupuncturist and I will tell people, and I'm always kind of singing her praises, but she changed my life. I mean, yeah. she helped me with my own mental health issues. So yeah. I really brought that to Nala, my dog. And so we started mm-hmm. with acupuncture and then got into Chinese food therapy and herbs. And then it just, you know, I went on a whole nother journey from there, (laughs) which I love. And I'm so passionate about it now. And in a way, her becoming sick, it changed. I mean, my husband's as well, but really her life and my life tremendously. It pushed me to look for holistic modalities for myself and for her. And it helped to reinvigorate my passion that I had, you know, as a five-year-old, because I had lost that. And I questioned whether I wanted to be a veterinarian at times. And it wasn't, that it was just changing your situation. And I think that's true for so many of us, whether we're veterinarians or accountants or lawyers or, you know, anything across the gamut, it's so important to continue to evolve as a human. Um, 
So I would say that's the big thing. And she, she really started responding well and watching her response to this approach to her therapy made it very clear to me that this was the next step in my career. So I did the very scary thing of quitting my full-time job of working for other people. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I started working for myself and Mm -hmm. it has been a complete pleasure and a blessing. And I'm grateful Mm -hmm. every single day. Mm -hmm. I really am. That's fantastic. Yeah. I feel like, and I've touched on this in other episodes too, but you know, you make that pivot and you're feeling that calling. And even though it's scary to leave, you know, what you know, as far as the job, you kind of somewhere deep inside, you know, this is the right choice and you know, this is, this is going to open up a whole different thing for you. Right. Exactly. And I think it's pushing ourselves out of that comfort zone that really leads to us. Some of us, you know, rediscovering our passion or discovering our initial passion in the first place. So I, yeah, I a hundred percent agree. And listening to that pull inside of you too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Talking through all the fear and all the whatnot. So exactly. Well, that's fantastic. And I know that you, um, one of the things that you specialize in right now, and you re- you wanted to really focus on today is talking about anxiety and stress reduction in our pets, because I think we see it more and more these days. Um, often we don't know what that really looks like. So I wanted to talk about how you diagnose or how you uh, identify, uh, uh, I guess you you would diagnose since you're a veterinarian, anxiety in dogs. <laughs> um, and then some of the common reasons that you may see anxiety and some of the method methodologies that you use to help treat our dogs who exhibit anxiety related behaviors, right? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yes. I would love to. Yes. Anxiety is, you know, it's incredibly common human and animals. I think a lot of us can identify with that. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, in general, there's a lot of different reasons why we see anxiety, but I would say that there's certain, there's really two major categories. There's situational anxiety, meaning, you know, your pet's generally relaxed and unbothered, but when there's certain stimuli introduced, they have a really marked change in their behavior. So some of those common stimuli are loud noises. So a lot of us Mm -hmm. have pets that are afraid of fireworks or, you know, the kickback of a gun or a car, even, you know, a loud car noise, garbage trucks. I mean, it runs the gamut, um, as well as being physically separated from your human or whoever you're bonded with, because sometimes for pets, that's the other animal in the house. Yeah. So I think that this was accentuated during COVID. So I was working for a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. I was working for a nonprofit in Los Angeles before COVID and then as COVID was occurring (laughs) upon us, descending (laughs) upon us. And I know a lot of people have heard these stats, but, you know, a lot of families adopted pets during COVID, which was wonderful, you know, great for the animals, great for the families. The problem really occurred once people started going back to a normal pace of life. Yeah. The animals that they adopted were not adjusted to being properly socialized because we were all social distancing, including our animals. Yeah. And they also were used to people being home 24 seven. So when you spend your first year or year and a half of life constantly being surrounded by your human family, and then you're by yourself for eight to 12 hours a day, it does cause severe anxiety in a lot of animals, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's not anyone's fault that that's happening. It's just none of us as a society had ever encountered this sort of situation. Right. So I would say separation anxiety is, it's always been common, but kind of during this COVID epidemic, it really exponentially increased. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Also being in certain environments can cause anxiety. So whether that's when your pet goes to the veterinarian, unfortunately, you know, because some uncomfortable things can happen there and they're smart and they'll associate that. So there's certain measures that we can take to reduce that from happening. Um, or even things like I've met dogs that are trauma, like that were traumatized because they fell in a pool when they were younger and they're terrified of pools. Mm -hmm. As soon as they see it, their whole behavior changes. So, you know, crates, there's all sorts of situations. And so, That's one set is situational anxiety. The other set is generalized anxiety. And whether that's from previous life experiences, animals that were, you know, abused or not well socialized when they were younger or even had severe illness when they were younger. I see a lot of dogs that had parvo or something else when they were young and it changes their microbiome. It changes the, the 
the little microorganisms that live in our gut, and this is true mm-hmm. for us and our pets, control 90% of the metabolic processes in our body. Yep. They communicate directly with our brain. I, they have such an influence on the way that we live our day-to-day lives. And I think that's very, it's not recognized in conventional medicine, right. which is unfortunate. And because of that, we end up inadvertently setting some of our dogs up to have issues because if yeah. a dog is on a large amount of antibiotics when they're young yeah. and they never receive proper microbiota replacement therapy or you know even something as simple as probiotics that can oftentimes set them up to have health issues down the line and a lot of times those manifest as anxiety yeah so i would say those are the two big categories for anxiety in general and then signs of anxiety are so variable so there are some key things that people can look for so excessive pacing, drooling, barking or vocalizing. Pretty standard. And I think anyone with anxiety can attest to this is increased heart rate, increased yeah. breathing rate. Um, destructive behaviors are huge. So, you know, a lot of people are, they think it's behavioral in that their animals are just being naughty, but yeah. a lot of times that's displacing their anxiety. Um, self-trauma. So we can, I've seen dogs that will lick or bite themselves to the point of having wounds, cats, mm-hmm. especially a lot of people will describe that their cats will overgrow their arms or their bellies, um, and other compulsive behaviors as well. So dogs that will just pace back and forth and jump on a door or even as extreme as breaking through windows. I've seen a lot of dogs yeah. do that as well, especially with noise phobia, uh, decreased appetites, inactivity or avoidant behavior, inappropriate elimination is a big one. That's the biggest reason why cats are surrendered to shelters is inappropriate elimination. Meaning and like a lot of times that's anxiety. Exactly. They're Got peeing it. on people's pillows or, yeah. you know, yeah. pooping in places they shouldn't. Um, and then even anal sac expression. And I'm sure some people have noticed that when your dog gets nervous, yeah. all of a sudden it has like a skunky odd or- odor and that's because they express their anal glands because that's a fear related response. Interesting. And then in the more extreme cases, aggression. And those are some of the cases that I've been pulled in to work on because yeah. standard conventional therapy, it's difficult to work with anxiety that manifests itself as aggression. And obviously that's a human safety issue as well, right. as well as an animal safety issue. Because if that's not something that we can manage appropriately, some of those animals need to get rehomed yep. or unfortunately can't be rehomed, yep. which is always tragic. Yeah. So what are some of the modalities that you help address anxiety with? I mean, I know conventional um, conventional veterinarians or uh, uh, veterinary animal behaviorists will generally do some sort of you know, anti-anxiety medication, like a Prozac or, or something like that, but you offer, um, other modalities. What, what, what are some of the things that some more of a holistic approach? Exactly. So okay. I would say, first of all, I always tell people, I, I consider myself an integrative veterinarian, yeah. meaning I still practice Western. Yes. I have patients that are on Prozac and on other SSRIs or other anti-anxiety meds. But I think the biggest difference is I really approach things in a multimodal fashion, meaning it's not just a pill for an ill, which is kind of a catchphrase that a lot of us in the holistic world will use, but it's true. I think the first step I always take is trying to identify if there's any pre-existing issues that could be causing, causing, excuse me, or worsening the anxiety. So animals that have pain Pain. or arthritis, that's a huge reason why we'll be anxious. And while we can treat the anxiety, if we don't treat the underlying foundational issue that led to the anxiety or exacerbated it, we're not going to have as good of a response. GI disease is a huge one. So Mm -hmm. animals that have a dysbiosis, meaning the microorganisms living in their gut are creating products that go straight up to their brain through their nervous system and will tell their brain to be anxious and vice versa. So a lot of people and animals, when we get nervous, like you know, fear of public speaking or whatever it might be for us as individuals, <laughs> we will actually feel physically ill and it tends yep, to be I'm our gut. And there's a reason real for that. Real candidate for that mm-hmm. one. Yep. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Myself as well. And Since then the I other- was a baby anyway. Yes. Yes. No, I'm the same way. And the yep. other one is cognitive disease as well. So I'll see a lot of older dogs and cats that become anxious, but it's because they're actually yeah. developing like doggy or kitty dementia, for lack of a better term. So all of those things are important to take into account. The next thing is I'm a huge proponent because I love everyone, any of my clients and anyone that knows me knows 
I love multiple supplements. I'm a huge believer in that. I don't think that one single thing is usually enough to yeah. cure or treat anything. And especially when you're coming from a more holistic approach. That? Sorry. That, that's the newest. She's a I massive actually. Yeah. <laughs> she wanted to chime in. <laughs> okay. um, She's like, I agree, mom. I exactly. Think that, yeah. Exactly. And funny enough, she actually suffers from anxiety. So I used Aww. to treat, she has received acupuncture from me to manage that. Got it. <laughs> so, so whenever I'm in, introducing a plan, a therapeutic plan where we're going to include multiple supplements, I'm a yeah. very big proponent of introducing things one at a time. So okay. really when you're doing that, it allows you to monitor for a response, both in a positive way, but then also any adverse effects. So right. the biggest thing that I see with holistic supplementation or, you know, functional medicinal mushrooms or Chinese herbs is a change in appetite or vomiting or diarrhea if they are going to have negative effects. But even then, it's not common, but I want to be able to pinpoint which one is causing the issue. She must see someone. Lewis. There's someone at the door. Hey. What's Lewis, happening? What's what are you doing? doing? Hi. Do you want to come with me? Here. Come over here. <laughs> <laughs> She's in here. She'll be quiet. Come okay. on, Lulu. Hi, Lewis. She's such a good girl. Hi, sweetheart. Come I on like in. I her name is Lewis. How did yeah, you Yeah, it's what actually you... Lulu, like Lulu Lemon, okay. but we, okay. she has 45 <laughs> names. I know. So that's my guy. Yeah. <laughs> Chance. Okay. Chance Chesterson. Yeah. Chester. Um, <laughs> exactly. Chancy pants. Oh. Okay. Perfect. Now that yeah. she's in here, she'll be quiet. Okay. Um, so okay. whenever I'm introducing things individually, I really, it allows us to monitor for a response. So right. in general with holistic supplements, the biggest negative side effects, and I say that in quotation marks, is GI upset, which is true of anything that we give by mouth. So I always tell my clients, you know, watch their appetite. If they're having a decreased appetite, that's a sign that we may need to back off on the dose or it may not be a good fit. And then vomiting or diarrhea, of course, but that's pretty rare that I see those. Yeah. So in terms of modalities, um, functional medicinal mushrooms, I am a huge mycophile for myself, for my patients. I absolutely love mushrooms. There are so many aspects of them that can be beneficial for not only preventative health, but also also treating disease. So for example, with mushrooms, they help to support cognitive health by promoting nerve formation in our brains, especially the areas of our brains that control stress um, and memory as well. They can actually mimic neurotransmitters that help to communicate stress between the brain and the body. So they can, there's over 400 compounds in a lot of these mushrooms that act on our body in different ways to what help I, mediate re- those. Yeah. Really quickly, what what kind of mushrooms are we talking about? We're not talking yes. about like the LSD type of mushrooms, Correct. Yeah. although I know they are doing something like that with the with dogs, but um but we're talking about like these are just like mushrooms that you put on your salad. Like I don't really know a lot about mushrooms, yeah, but okay. I know they have huge health benefits, yes. right? So we're yes, you we're not talking about psychedelic mushrooms in yeah. this case, but you are right. <laughs> there are a small subset of people that are looking into that um, for animals, episode. yes, <laughs> which is so fascinating, but um, these mushrooms, I'm talking more specifically about, you know, some of the ones that people are aware of, maitake, okay. shiitake, oyster mushrooms, okay. but I think yep. some of the big players for me personally are reishi, lion's mane, chaga, turkey tail is a huge one we're talking about, cancer, um, so sort of along those lines. So not okay. necessarily mushrooms that we will cook with in like North American culture, but okay. in Asia especially, it's used yeah. a lot in cuisine, of course, but also has medicinal properties. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So the mushrooms also can decrease inflammation, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. So instead of using like a low dose anti-inflammatory drug in some situations, you can actually institute mushrooms. It's just all of the holistic modalities. I tell people, you know, anything natural is going to take a little bit longer to exert an effect. So we all have to modify our expectations with conventional medication you yeah, give it. That's what it is, isn't mm-hmm, it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You give it, and there's an effect almost right away. But this, the problem with that is there's a lot of side effects as well. Right. Yeah. Um, so functional medicinal mushrooms are a huge one for me. Adaptogens are another one, which obviously are very popular on the human side. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> mushrooms can actually fit into the category of adaptogens as well. But in, with adaptogens, really, our main focus or the main benefit that we're providing by supplementing with that is protecting from oxidative damage, increasing our body and our pet's body's resistance to stress by altering 
the hormones in the glands that are actually responsible for regulating the stress within our body. So specifically our hypothalamus, our pituitary and our adrenal glands, which we call the HPA axis. But that's our adrenal glands are what produce epinephrine. So that fight or flight response hormone, Mm -hmm. but then it also produces cortisol, which I think a lot of people are becoming more familiar with because that is a hormone that suppresses our immune system. It really changes our entire body's metabolic function. So mm -hmm, yeah, and our pets undergo that as well. Another huge one, which I know you had Dr. Trina Hazza on, but cannabis is... I did. And then I found yes. out that she was your friend. <laughs> yes, she is. Yeah. We work together doing cannabis yeah. consultations. Yeah. She's so, great. She okay. is so knowledgeable. Um, I've been very fortunate yeah, to learn so from her. She really is. So cannabis has direct anti-inflammatory effects, also actually works at neurotransmitter receptors to promote relaxation and mood balance. And yeah. when used appropriately with our pets, it can have that same effect. So it's actually a phenomenal tool for anxiety management. And then I would say the other big one for me, because I'm basically obsessed with food therapy, is food energetics. (laughs) So in Chinese medicine, anxiety is considered what's called a shen disturbance. So there's certain foods that you can provide that help to support the heart as an organ. And I know this is kind of hard for people who don't have a lot of understanding of Chinese medicine, but basically the shen, which is our spirit, Mm. lives in our heart. And when you have a stressful event or something that occurs to them make your shen displaced from your heart, that's considered a shen disturbance. And that manifests a lot of times as anxiety. Interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't know it in those terms. And mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. Yes. It's beautiful. And if you think about it too, there's a lot of animals, I would say, especially dogs, small breed dogs that are very anxious or high strung. Yeah. And a lot of them develop heart disease. So it's not a coincidence that that organ system is being taxed so much over time that initially the shen gets displaced, but over time, the energy is drained from that organ system, which then leads to structural change, valves yeah. being floppy or the muscle, you know, getting thin and stretching out and then can lead to complications. Wow. <laughs> That's so fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then acupuncture, sound therapy, essential oils. I use crystals, Ooh, of course. So yeah. all of those can as we well. Can we talk about sound therapy? And yes. Can we talk about crystals? Because, yes. you know, I don't come across <laughs> many veterinarians who use sound therapy or crystals. So I would love to, to jump in on that a little bit. Definitely. So sound therapy is very interesting because I think, you know, when we talk about humans, yeah. some people will have preconceived notions about things and that will block their ability to feel the healing benefits from some of these modalities. But the beauty of our animals is they don't have that. (laughs) You know, they are, they're open vessels. They are whatever environment that they're in, they will receive the energetics that are being presented to them. So specifically for sound therapy, the goal is using certain frequencies to target Mm -hmm. different chakras. And Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are aware of chakras, but just for those that aren't, it's the energy system within our body. And it can become blocked or misaligned, which leads to an impedance of energy circulating through properly. So that idea of energy circulating through our body is true in a lot of different cultural or I would almost say like indigenous medicine. So whether it's Chinese yeah. medicine, Ayurveda, like obviously sh- the whole chakra system comes more from um, India as well. But that same theme is often seen. So I always point right. that out to people too. You know, it's not just one culture that has found residence with this. It's a repetitive theme. It is. So I think everyone has their own take or spin on it, but a lot of, there's a lot of overlap in the approaches and the ideology. So with sound therapy in particular, I will, I will kind of use it in two different ways. So I do actually have a crystal quartz sound bowl that I will play. And if for anyone Mm -hmm. that's been present Mm -hmm. for any sort of sound therapy healing session, I've done sound baths before. Mm-hmm. And They're amazing. Them. Not a, not as many as I would like, yes. but I did in about four. And yeah, they were they were fantastic. I'm not it is. Yeah. It is. And so I think there's a degree. So with us, the vibration is part of it. And then the sound yeah. is also an added benefit. I have found right. that some animals become slightly, I don't want to say agitated, but I, I'm going to yeah, say that because it's the ask. best word because yeah. I feel like it's a little too intense for them initially. So if the vibrational 
type of approach is too much. What I oftentimes will do is I will play chakra healing frequencies. So there's different frequencies that are associated with each chakra. And in particular for anxiety, we're targeting the heart chakra. So that mm-hmm. happens to be around 639 hertz, give or take a few hertz, just depending on um, people's view of it. <laughs> but yeah. the idea is by playing that, you're helping to actually remove blockages or create alignment that was not present. And then that allows the energy to continue to circulate, which promotes repair or yeah. resolution of issues that have developed from it. Are sound, is that something that you can, can you buy like a, you know, CD of that? Or I don't, do people still buy CDs anymore? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. So I, I or, think you or can. Or can you stream it? Because yes. like I have one client yes. who is, he really, he's, he's super sound sensitive. So like an actual mm. sound bath type of a situation mm-hmm. would be way too crazy for him. Um, he suffers from, he, he is not, quite for lack of a better term like wired correctly like he yeah. there's he's he's he goes from zero to ten in two seconds he's mm. super sound sensitive he's touch sensitive but i have a feeling something like that really quietly in the background would be mm-hmm. you know soothing for him most certainly help to so, keep him calm yes yeah. i so every time we leave my dog because she also has some anxiety because she's her mother's child yeah um <laughs> I play chakra healing frequencies for her. So that's what she listens to all day. There you go. There are playlists. There's a playlist that I use specifically on Spotify. So, but people can look anywhere. Um, There are chakra healing frequency playlists that either that. And so there are studies that show that classical music or reggae tend to be more calming for dogs, Mm -hmm. which I love. And I also promote those. But if you're specifically looking for something that is a bit more targeted, I would highly encourage people to try it. And then they'd be looking for like the heart chakra. They could do, or they could do a rotational one. So the one that I have goes through multiple different frequencies just to help. So with root chakra or sacral or yeah, complexes, third eye kind of goes through all the different chakra systems. That's so great. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So I, yeah, I would highly recommend people giving that a shot because it's nice. And then also just playing music for animals that are reactive is helpful. So it's why not have a double benefit if you get to choose what the playlist is. Totally. Yeah. Also just another chance to just every probably everyone in the room will be nice and calm. Exactly. General, exactly. Too. It's a benefit for everybody. <laughs> so when you use Reiki, which is a form of um which is a form of energy healing. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, many moons ago, I was a massage therapist. It didn't last very long, but oh, I was wow. certified, certified massage therapist. And I did go through um, Reiki one. This was like, mm-hmm. I'm not, I think like maybe, I mean, almost 20 years ago. Um, I, uh, before I got my dog and decided that that's the route I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. As as we say, as we chatted about, like often our dogs direct us in the the route that we're supposed to be heading. So, so I'm a little bit familiar with Reiki and then I do get it done. My, my acupuncturist who I love does energy work as well. Oh, beautiful. Um, And she's so great. And, um, so I'm all for that. Um, how do you use that with, with dogs? Maybe we could explain energy work a little bit to people who may not know or may maybe on the fence about it or any yeah, of the things. Yeah. Definitely. So for me, I, I mean, people, there are some Reiki practitioners that will just use it by itself. They just sit there, yeah. hold space and intention. And really what you're doing is you're encouraging the cells and the tissues and the organ systems of the body that generate a specific, a specific biomagnetic field. You're you're helping to correct any imbalances or misalignments. So sort of similar to the same idea that we just spoke about with chakras. Um, And they actually have done some studies that there is a different, because we all have biomagnetic energy that we put off. And there's a different frequency of the pulsations of that biomagnetic energy being emitted from the hands of a Reiki practitioner or healer when they're working. And that frequency will also change during the course of treatment. So that's encouraging stimulation of healing throughout the body. In general, yeah. when Reiki is done with humans, it's a bit more on contact or just slightly off contact is probably the best way of putting it. So for those that aren't familiar, your Reiki practitioner is not usually in direct contact with you, but they're hovering right above certain areas. Mm-hmm. Dogs and cats are so much more sensitive. Really, I should say animals in general, because you can do Reiki with any anything, um, yeah. whether it's a plant or an animal or a yeah. human, of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, for me, myself, in my experience, a lot of animals you know, especially if they have anxiety or have behavioral issues, it's best to actually perform Reiki in the space that they're in and not making direct contact with them. 
Yeah. I think right when I, cause same thing, I went through my Reiki practitioner training. When I finished the first appointment I had after that, it's a house with multiple dogs and they're mm. the dog I work on there is a shepherd, but there's a Pomeranian that lives there as well. <laughs> and the Pomeranian has always been very standoffish and would bark at mm-hmm. me. And I've, you know, I've understood that's just their personality and, and their mm-hmm. journey. <laughs> but when I was working on my shepherd patient there, and I was actually performing acupuncture and Reiki at the same time. So I was holding space for her while we were doing her acupuncture session. The Pomeranian, I turned to my side and the Pomeranian was sitting next to me and she had never done that yeah. before. So they can really sense that soft, energetic shift that's occurring. So yeah. I tend to use it in combination with other modalities. I get it. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. So when you're when you're choosing the, the modalities that you want to use on a, on a pet, is that just something that comes instinctually to you? Or is there a specific kind of like protocol when it comes to natural medicine? So I would say, a, yeah, yeah. I, that does make sense. A lot, a lot of it for me is intuitive. And yeah. that's not meaning that I, I don't use, you know, science and logic and all of the right. skills that I've, <laughs> I've practiced over the Worked past so decade. Hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think it's really an integration of the two. I, I, some of it for me is the constitution of the animal. And mm-hmm. by that, I mean, in, in Chinese medicine, both human and traditional veterinary there are, there's something called the five element theory. And so there's five kind of personality types, if you will. And when I teach people about this, it's really funny because a lot of my clients, the next time I see them, they're like, oh my gosh, you're so right. Like my husband is this, my daughter is this, my friend is this. And they start going through (laughs) and they're like, so much of this makes sense to me, but there are, so with, of the five constitutions, for example, there's two fire and wood that tend to be very challenging to perform acupuncture Mm. on. So as soon as I figure, as soon as I'm able to assess what type of constitution they are, I will prepare the client and let them know I am more than happy to try, you know, this and this and this modality, but I'm also going to respect what your pet is telling me. So if it is causing anything, anything in terms of stress or, you know, making them wary of me, we're not going to approach it that way. And then there's other types So the other elements that I haven't mentioned are earth and metal and water. And just the different needling techniques that come with those constitutions, but also what foods would be best for them. What's what animals will be more likely to have GI upset from supplements, because that's also determined by their constitution as well. So how do you know which dog has a which constitution? Yes. And 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 I'm also wondering (laughs) what kind of constitution I have people wise. (laughs) So there's certain characteristics for each constitution. So basically an earth constitution when you think about it, it's a laid back, loyal, friendly, I'm going to say animal, because we're talking about yeah. pets. Um, yeah. They can tend to have a tendency to be overweight. So, okay. and the other thing is they, the organ systems associated with the different constitutions. So for earth, it's associated with spleen and stomach, which the spleen is the digestive organ in Chinese mm. medicine. So a lot of earth animals, when they are out of balance, will have gastrointestinal disease, whether that's yeah. stress, diarrhea, or over mm-hmm. time, inflammatory bowel disease, like my dog, Nala is an earth. Um, so it's knowing what they're more likely to have when they're in balance, and you can help you preventatively stop them from heading in that direction. Got it. So fire personality, so that's a really fun one. They tend to be the life of the party. They want to be the center of attention. <laughs> they're pretty vocal. They're like, look at me, look at me. Uh, but they also tend to be prone to anxiety and prone to heart issues. Mm -hmm. So again, kind of going back to that Shen disturbance idea that is commonly seen with fire personalities and fire personalities tend to be very difficult to needle. They tend to be very sensitive to dry needling itself. So I oftentimes have to adapt and use laser acupuncture or something like Tui Na, which is Chinese therapeutic massage, which allows me to have the same influence on the energy channels that I, that I'm, influencing with acupuncture, but it allows me to do it in a subtle and softer way. So I I really tailor it to them, I would say. So whether that's, you know, trial and error. Mm -hmm. Right. Can we go through all of the, we have time to go through all of the five elements? I'm so curious because yes. I'm like thinking about all of my dogs that I care for and I'm like, yes. oh, he would be that one. Yeah. And he would be that. If we could just like briefly just touch of course. on it. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. So we touched on fire and earth. Okay. Next is wood. Wood okay. elements are, they call it the general. So they're assertive, they're confident, they're dominant, they're fearless, they're strong, they're a little impulsive. 
Um, mm. They can be what quote unquote bossy. Um, mm-hmm. So those animals are the second one that can be a little tricky to needle. I happen yeah. to be a wood personality. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then where I should also say, you know, we all have a predominant personality, but then there's other okay. aspects of the other elements within us, right? So we're okay. not usually just one thing 100%, just like with anything else that yeah. is in our lives. There's a spectrum. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So wood elements tend to be, when they're unbalanced, they will have a lot of ligament or tendon problems. So I see dogs that have cruciate tear. So basically they, they tear their ACL or mm. they have liver issues. Okay. Red eyes or some behavioral issues where they'll be really irritable or anger easily. And mm. then the organ systems associated with wood are the liver and the gallbladder. And I know this is going to be a little bit um, difficult to interpret in, in some ways for people, but the gallbladder is very related to dogs that have recurrent ear issues. So it tends to be what we call oh. damp heat or dampness. So uh-huh. a lot of dogs that are wood that are unbalanced will have recurrent ear infections or foot or nail issues, and sometimes even seizures. Oh. Yeah. Next, I don't is, know if I have any dogs any that woods? I care for that fit, fit into that. Yeah. But I will say, personally, my acupuncturist always tells me it's my gallbladder that's having mm. issues. So, but I don't think I fit into that description. But I don't know. <laughs> you might want to ask her too, because your will. acupuncturist yeah. will definitely. I mean, almost all of them, unless they practice. There's Japanese and Chinese acupuncture, so there yeah. could be some variation. She's but Chinese acupuncture. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Then she'll yeah. be able to tell your element for sure. Okay. Um, okay. Continue. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> so the next one is water. Water okay. animals tend to be very careful, very timid and shy and fearful. Mm. They'll hide or run away. So a good example that I'll give other veterinarians when I'm trying to explain this to them is when you walk into a room and there's, you know, a chihuahua that looks at you and then runs under the chair to hide from you, yeah. hide under their own yeah. chair. That's a good example of a water personality. Um, but interestingly enough, they tend to have a very long lifespan and they tend to have, when they're healthy, they have really strong teeth and bones. So they're a very huh. observant individual. Now, when water you think person- they have mm-hmm. a long health span, sorry, but you oh, think no, they have okay. a long health span because they're cautious to not do anything that would put them in any in harm's way in any way, shape, or form? You know, that's a great <laughs> question. I think, at least on the Chinese medicine side of things, it's thought to be more a characteristic of the element itself. So fire personalities, unfortunately, Uh have the shortest lifespan because they tend to be like, boom, 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 so energetic. They use too much energy. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And you're right, waters are almost more like conservationists. So they (laughs) they disperse their energy (laughs) over time and save it up so it lasts longer. (laughs) Interesting. (laughs) Okay, sorry. No, it's okay. (laughs) Um, So when water personalities are unbalanced, they tend Uh to have, and these are some of the biggest issues that we deal with when our dogs get older hind end weakness, arthritis, yeah. disc disease, urinary problems, kidney mm-hmm. disease, because the water okay. elements are, or the water organs, excuse me, are the kidney and the urinary bladder. So okay. we tend to see issues with that. Um, the water element gets a little bit complicated because short of having that, all of these elements as personality types, different stages of our lives are associated with different elements. So the end of our lives are associated more with water. So it's very interesting. And it makes sense that, you know, when what the issues that we deal with as we age and as our pets age tend to be more water conditions. But then if they're a water personality, those things can sometimes happen earlier. Um, And there's a lot more complexity because all of these different elements interact with each other. So each of them is either the child or a parent of the other element. So there's some influence with that as well, <laughs> but that's probably a, a whole nother podcast. Whole other podcast on yep. <laughs> I'll make a note of it. Yeah, yep. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then last but not least are the metal personalities. So mm. these dogs or people, <laughs> these beings mm-hmm. really love order and rules. So Mm. A lot of veterinarians actually end up being metal. They're very regimented. They yeah. like things a certain way. Um, they can be a little bit aloof, a little bit quiet, but they're also independent um, yeah. and well disciplined. And right. for on the animal side, they have a good hair coat usually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, the unbalance <laughs> of the metal is dry skin, sinus oh. issues, nasal mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. kind of asthmatic conditions coughing, breathing difficulty. And the metal element itself is actually associated with the lung and the large intestine. And the lung in Chinese medicine is really responsible for a lot of our immune system. 
Mm-hmm. So it's interesting that, you know, we think of why is that? Yeah. Yeah. So we think of it and, you know, the lung has such a, a thin layer of tissue within itself, right? It's composed of very thin tissue because that's how air can be exchanged back and forth. And interestingly right. enough, the lung and the skin are directly connected in Chinese medicine. So a lot of animals that have allergies, it's actually associated or immune system issues. It's associated with yeah. the metal or metal element or the lung organ. Yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> so how do you use when you're addressing like food with you mentioned food therapy and mm-hmm. I know you you can address food therapy um with uh in a kind of in alignment with what we were just talking about, mm-hmm. right? With people with with, with dogs different elements, right? Uh, yeah, so for me, you know, food, I look at it in a few different ways. So first of all, food for me is so important when it comes to us talking about our pets yeah. and their health because It is the one thing that all of us do every single day and what we choose to feed them really sets them up for both short and long-term longevity, as well as just health in general, their well-being. So when we're choosing food, so for example, a healthy young animal, because surprisingly, I think a lot of people probably assume that most of the patients I'm seeing are sick and older. Half of my patients are under two years old. Because they're people that have identified that there are some lapses in the conventional veterinary system, which again, I don't mean that as a criticism because I love conventional sure. medicine and it is essential in a lot of situations. But I think when it comes to preventative medicine, we're yeah. lacking. And so for people that identify with that, they want to get their pet started off on the right foot from the beginning because they appreciate that that leads to a healthier and longer time that they have yes. with their pets. So when we're talking about the constitutions, there's certain foods that we can provide that help to build them up constitutionally. So if I have a earth personality, there are certain foods I'm going to choose that help to support those elements and therefore help them be resistant to the diseases that they're maybe more prone to when they encounter everyday life stresses, because it's going to happen. It happens to us, it happens to them. So It's building them up or tonifying them so that they're more resilient when they encounter those things. Is there um, a connection between, I mean, there must be since there's a connection between, as you were saying, the gut microbiome and and Mm -hmm. anxiety. And um, Mm -hmm. so is there a connection between food, like food therapy and anxiety, like certain foods that, you know, might help other other than the mushrooms that might be beneficial Mm -hmm. for dogs that have anxiety issues? Okay. Definitely. So specifically, there's two different aspects or ways of okay. thinking about this. One is with with food energetics and food therapy, foods actually have different temperatures associated with them. So there's hot, warm, neutral, cool, and cold okay. foods. So if you think about anything that's inflammation or excess, right, which anxiety is excessive energy, if you will, that's being misdirected, we don't want to add any hot foods to that because you're literally adding fuel to the fire. So you want to focus on foods that are either neutral in temperature or cool or cold, depending on the other aspects of the patient. So for example, if I have a patient that has anxiety and is eating a lamb based Mm -hmm. diet, lamb is very hot as a protein. That That is one of the first things we change. So I focus on not only the energetics of the food, but then also how the food is made. So traditional kibbles are all heat processed. So they're all hot. So if you're feeding a kibble or, you know, some sort of dry food, I encourage my clients to at least feed a neutral or cool protein. So beef or turkey or duck, because if we're feeding lamb or venison, and especially for us living in Southern California, it's pretty hot here all the time. Very few animals, there are some, but very few need that extra heat. So sometimes that will lead to exacerbation of their anxiety or their other inflammatory conditions. So kind of to go back more specifically to what you were asking in terms of foods for anxiety some a lot of the things i usually recommend are different grains so like millet is one that is really really helpful and it's a grain that's not as commonly used but i love it because it's a chi or energy tonic as well and then it also specifically helps to calm the shen so it's helpful for those anxious conditions interesting chicken mm-hmm. 
can be helpful too. And then one other big, I guess, focus within Chinese medicine is if you have an organ that's unbalanced, you actually want to feed the animal that organ. (laughs) So if an animal has anxiety mm -hmm, and that's a heart related condition, feeding small amounts of chicken heart or turkey heart can be helpful or pork hearts. Another one I use a lot because pork's another neutral right. protein. So you can do small amounts. And obviously this needs to be under the direction yeah. of your veterinarian because you can only feed so much organ meat and you need to prepare it properly. Yeah. But things like that can be very helpful. Lettuce, because it's cooling, can be helpful for shen disturbances. <laughs> do a lot of dogs like lettuce. Dates. I don't I know. know many dogs exactly. that will eat lettuce. Yeah. <laughs> Some <laughs> depends of them on will. the dog. Yeah. Definitely <laughs> depends on the dog. Um, dates, pecans, mm. um, Longan, which is a more of a Chinese fruit. It reminds me a lot of lychee, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. but that's something else that mm-hmm, you can get that you just have to take the pit out, but you can feed that cardamom and cayenne and Chinese ginseng, rosemary in small amounts. Um, and then even in horses, you can use things like alfalfa right. or corn silk. Right. Mm-hmm. So there are certain foods that you can feed. There's some companies that I will have my clients use for treats. Cause that's another thing I like yeah. to utilize is, you know, food and their diet is important, but also the treats that we choose can be yeah. helpful. So there's freeze dried. Yeah. We do that. Yeah. Organ meat that's available. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's a great option because that's just going to help alleviate their anxiety and calm their shit. I ask what, uh, as far as like freeze dried is concerned, you mentioned that, um, that like kibble is like a hot food, right? What would a freeze dried mm-hmm. be mm-hmm. Would that? Is that still hot because it's processed or is it, I, how does that work? Curious. Yeah, that's a good question. So because we're not adding heat into the food for ah. processing, that shouldn't change the energetics very much. So I do try okay. for people that need more flexibility yeah. with the diets. I try to use air dried or freeze dried foods for Got that it. reason. Um, if I am going to use a kibble, probably 90, over 95% of the kibbles that are available on the market are extruded, meaning go, they go through this really high yeah. heat processing to the point that the nutrients of the food are diminished or affected so much that they will then spray the outside of the kibble with palatins and vitamins and minerals to replace yeah. it. So I am not a huge fan of extruded food right. for that reason. I try to use, if any, if we have to use kibble, I go for baked okay. kibble, which it's hard to find, but if you call the manufacturers and yeah. ask or, you know, reach out and connect with the holistic veterinarian, they can point you in the right direction. Yeah. But there's under 20 varieties of that that I've been was, able to find, which if you think about everything on yeah. the market, it's a very, very, it's a minority. I was going to say, so if say people were really just, um, really, uh, attached to feeding kibble, is there something mm-hmm. specific that they should be looking for when they're doing their research into what kibble to use? So I would say, and this is where I'll probably deviate a little bit from the holistic side of things, um, grain free, which I know is a very debated topic, but I myself have diagnosed multiple dogs with DCM secondary to a grain free diet. So as personally, as a practitioner, I really urge people to try to avoid it. And although there has not been a direct correlation Uh found yet, 89% 89% of the patients had peas or pea ingredients right. in the top list of the ingredients of the, the diet. substitutions. That's the issue, right? We think. Yeah. I mean, I know you can't really. They think, but then they're yeah. not sure because I, so I spoke with a few nutritionists at universities in the past few weeks because I actually am working on an article for um, someone else for a grain-free yeah. diet, just kind of update on the situation. And there's the belief that the peas may even have an anti-nutritive property to them that is somehow blocking amino acid synthesis or intervening in a way that even if you're feeding a complete diet and you're providing other animal proteins, even the peas being present may be causing a direct issue. So they're just really unsure. So my, I would say my biggest piece of advice for people is when you're choosing kibble, avoid peas. It's just not worth it. It's not worth the risk. And not every dog on those diets is going to develop heart disease, but I've met four-year-old, even a few weeks ago, I met a four-year-old pit bull that had right. nutritionally secondary yeah. DCM from having a diet that was high in peas. And it's just, it's preventable and it's, it's really are tragic. Are peas a legume? Um, so are they? They are. Yes, they are a legume. Well, that's what they're researching, whether it's, it is the addition of like legumes as a substitute for the grains. Mm-hmm. That's the issue versus mm-hmm. the grain itself. Exactly. Yeah. So Exactly. And it's so inconsistent too. So like even for Nala, like I put lentils in her home cooked Uh diet and I love them for their energetic properties, but 
I take x-rays on her frequently. (laughs) I will often rotate because I I worry. And so for my, for my clients, I tell them, you know, especially peas, just avoid them. There's not enough energetic benefits to even warrant the risk. It's not worth it. Yeah. It's just not worth it. And then otherwise I would say the big things and in general, I'm going to talk more about hot conditions because that's where I practice, you know, lamb and venison are all great proteins, but they're very hot. So in general, if you're going to choose an extruded kibble diet and you know there's already extra heat added, choose a fish diet. Fish is cool. Choose pork. I mean, chicken is warm. So many dogs have allergies to chicken though, right? Isn't that what... They do. And that's another interesting interesting thing to bring up Mm -hmm. because I have found that sometimes it's truly an allergy. Other times it's actually the food energetics. So if I, they can stay on chicken, but if I add more cooling foods, their allergies resolve. So it's just that they had too much heat. So, but there are some dogs that truly have a chicken allergy, not to discount that. So I would say the biggest things are avoid peas, contact the company and ask them, is this diet extruded or is this diet baked? Because if it's a baked kibble, much better. It's not as processed. So it's a more of a kind of a gentle cook, but air dried and freeze dried, if you can, are definitely the way to go. Okay. So circling back to really quickly. So circling back to the food therapy, <laughs> how do, how do you use that in your practice? I know we were touching on that before I. No, you're okay. You. You're okay. So, okay. so wellness wise, <laughs> I think it's more tonifying them as a constitution or building them up as a constitution. Okay. And now what I'm talking about, cause that's also disease prevention, which we kind of touch yeah. base on when I'm dealing with ill animals, it depends mm-hmm. on the organ system. So if I have, cause a lot of my patients, cause I am a physical, I do canine rehab therapy as well as acupuncture. Mm-hmm. So for a lot of my patients, I'm dealing with arthritis and intervertebral disc disease. And that, as we just spoke about is a kidney related issue. So I will right. feed a lot of kidney tonifying items to them to support them as I'm doing physical modalities with them as well. So Got things it. like chicken breast or chicken thigh, duck breast, um, I, it's a little bit hard and this is a hot protein, but goat is also, yeah. um, Interesting. yeah, I tell, salmon is, I've heard of goat milk. I haven't mm-hmm. heard of uh, goat meat. Eating goat. Yeah. Goat there's, meat there's some dogs. companies that will make goat diets. It's not as common, but yeah. eat a lot of fish and then Turkey is a, a kidney tonic as well. And then you okay. get into like the carbohydrates and then we're talking, I use a lot of beans Um, beans tend to be very supportive of the kidney, whether they're black beans or kidney beans. And so I use a lot of that as well. And so it's really just, I, and I also like to circulate through food. So yeah, I, I try to mix it up conservatively so that we're offering them different things and then also offering them different energetics. So sometimes I'll use an energy or a chi tonic. Other times I'll be using more of a blood booster, And that just helps to support the organ system that is deficient, build it back up to where it should be. And then we can get to the point that it's preventative. And then of course, a lot of my patients have multiple diseases. So I'm combining things and balance is essential. So that's the other thing is I, I mean, I home cook for my dog. I have been for three years. It's a lot of work. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No, I don't blame you. It's a lot of work, but I also, you know, I have had her recipes reviewed by a nutritionist. And I encourage my clients to do the same thing. And I myself will formulate diets for people. And I have a program where I can make it a balanced diet with supplementation, but in special cases, I'll still pull a nutritionist in because I still want the, the macro or the large nutritional aspect to be covered appropriately for that disease condition. Got it. So it's always, it really should be under the guidance of someone that's comfortable helping guide people. Right. Do you have a story of like success of a dog since we're really focusing on anxiety kind of today, like that you, a dog that you were treating that had anxiety, um, that you were able to kind of address and get some sort of relief for that kind of shares a special place in your heart, maybe? Definitely. So I, I had a client who has now become a good friend of mine (laughs) and she actually (laughs) happens to make, she's very much into crystal therapy. Oh, we didn't talk about crystal therapy. Oh God, Mm -hmm. there's so much. Yeah. Yeah. So So she actually makes accessories for dogs and cats Mm -hmm. that have crystals as a part of them. So collars and harnesses. Um, she makes a crystal infused water bottle, which I recommend for a lot of my Do patients you give and knowledge a, a uses every day. Do you, does she have a website? Yes, okay. I would love to. Mercy Collective. Okay. She makes fabulous products. They're very sustainable and 
environmentally friendly. Got Sorry, it. Charlotte. It's okay. Let me go grab her. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted to get out. Where is Lewis? She? Lewis. We're almost done, Lewis. I, I know, know it's a lot for you. That little lady. She, you said she's what a master. Come here. She oh, is. How many she pounds had, is she? She had a lot of trauma. She's 120. Oh. Come on, little lady. She's a big sweetheart, though. I have a, um, a come on, good girl. Saint Bernard Great Pyrenees mix that I care for, oh. and he just went to the vet and got weighed, and <laughs> he needs to drop. Oh. He needs to drop a couple of lbs. He's one oh, one seventy six. <laughs> Oh my goodness. He's a big boy. He's a, really He's a big, big boy. boy. Oh my goodness. <laughs> He's a love bug though. Yeah, I know. Some of those big dogs are so soft on the inside. Oh She's a great example yeah, of that. Sure. Yeah, I've never met a mastiff that mm-hmm. I've, they've all been like just mush. Yeah. So. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Anyway, um, so sorry. Okay. If I tried yeah, to okay. So, <laughs> so, um, so yes, yeah, so she, she makes her own crystal line, yeah. which is amazing. And so obviously she's really focused on holistic hair as much as possible. Yeah. And her dog, she has a black Pomeranian. Mm. He's absolutely adorable and a love, but suffers from anxiety. Mm-hmm. And so when I met them, she had, she had chronic issues getting him to finish his meals mm-hmm. And he would actually urinate mm. on their bed, on their pillows every evening, every night. Mm-hmm. So she was recommended by her conventional veterinarian to start him on Prozac. And she really, really did not mm-hmm. want to go that route mm-hmm. unless she absolutely had to. Right. So it was, and I, I told her, and this is the same thing I prep all my clients for. This is going to be a slow integration of things. We really have to take our time and, you know, do things one at a time, like we talked about before. So I used for him targeted pulse electromagnetic therapy, and that's a specific type of treatment that decreases inflammation in the amygdala, which is a part of the brain that actually mediates anxiety. So anxiety is an inflammatory condition in a certain part of our brain and our pet's brains. Mm -hmm. So this specific system helps to decrease inflammation there. Is this what like the Azizi loop is? Is that exactly oh! for calmer canine? Yeah, okay, yep, good. You're right. We yep. use that Which for inflammation, not for his anxiety, but yes. for like his joints yes. and stuff. Oh, so I'm mm-hmm. gonna give a shout. I get also get no money for this, but I'm gonna give a shout out to yeah. Azizi <laughs> because it's really they changed do. our lives. Yes, they do. They do great work, and the calmer canine is really revolutionary. They have studies where it specifically was made for separation anxiety, but I've used it for all different types, noise phobias. I mean, really any sort of anxiety <gasps> can benefit this from it. Help with my dog. Who's got all the stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yes, definitely. So we instituted that for him. We started him on cannabis okay. for him in particular. And I will do this for a lot of my patients. A lot of them have imbalances. Yeah. So I started him on a multi-mineral supplement two different functional medicinal mushrooms. And over the course of about four to six weeks, he started eating better, which she was shocked about. And I explained to her, and this is very common, just like with us, when they're anxious and worked up like Mm -hmm. that, their tummies are upset. So when you decrease that anxiety level, oftentimes their appetites will increase. Interesting. So for the first time, he was actually finishing his meals and she was shocked. That was actually probably one of the first changes we noticed with him. And she noticed that two weeks into his treatment. And then we were closer to the four to six week point because that's how long the pulse electromagnetic therapy takes. And of course, instituting one thing at a time, he got to the point that he stopped urinating on their pillows altogether. Wow! It decreased slowly, but then it got to the point that it stopped. I should say the other thing I used for him was essential oil therapy. So I had her diffuse a certain essential oil. And then we also did a petting method where every night I taught her how to stroke him in a certain way that encourages endorphin release and using essential oil simultaneously while she did that. So he got to the point without any Western meds, which I will also preface is not always the case. I have patients that are on both. So I have patients that are on Prozac and then on a lot of different holistic supplements too, because they just need it. They can be incredibly useful, incredibly helpful. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, but yeah, he was one that I think was a real eye opener. Not only, you know, I always learn from my patients. And so it was beautiful to watch his transformation. And then also it opened up the eyes of his conventional vet yeah, interesting. <laughs> because yeah, yeah, she's also a friend of ours. So it was a really interesting experience yeah. for us all to share together. <laughs> yeah. Well, cause they don't to study that you have to do what you do. Mm-hmm. You have to, you know, take it upon yourself to go and people don't have time to do that, you know, unless they're really called for it. So yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, interesting. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. It was really special. And 
you know, that's the other thing is I am so appreciative for all the conventional veterinarians that are out there because it is a very, there's a stressful time for everyone in the world, but veterinarians have really, and the veterinary industry has undergone a lot of excessive stress during COVID. So, Mm -hmm. you know, for all of those holding down the fort, they're, they're doing the best that they can. And I am happy to help support them however I can. But one of the issues I run into is a lot of, a lot of people that are more conventionally trained want, you know, large evidence-based medicine and research and a lot of information to support the choices that they're making. And while I understand that, if there's not a large pharmaceutical company that's going to benefit from some of these modalities, it's hard to get that funding. So I usually will approach things from a do no harm perspective. (laughs) And a lot of it ends up being personal experience and I'll have great success with certain things. And then I will even teach my conventional colleagues about it and then they'll start instituting it. So a, so a do no harm perspective, you're meaning you're saying, you're essentially saying like, this cannot hurt your dog. So it can only be helpful or how, how do you exactly. So yeah. So there's not, exactly. a, there's, this is not going to do anything to you professionally if something bad happens because nothing bad can happen except for maybe some GI upset. Right. So a hundred percent. So that's what I tell people is GI upset is always yeah. a possibility, but beyond that, I will never institute anything that does not have evidence-based medicine right. behind it and could potentially be toxic. So you either won't see change mm-hmm. or you'll see a great change. A exactly. Great, po- positive change. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So that's really important to me because a lot of the conventional medicines that I've depended on for years and years and my colleagues do as well, we know that they have negative yeah. side effects and some of them aren't even really recognized on the Western side. So one really good example is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory yeah. drugs. So I won't say the brand names, but carprofen and Meloxicam mm-hmm. and a lot of the things that our older arthritic dogs yeah. are on, it changes their microbiome. Mm-hmm. So there, there are dogs that will develop anxiety after being on those drugs. They will develop GI disease. Yeah. And it's because we're not supporting their microbiome simultaneously. And the same is true for antacids. Um, so things like omiprazole yeah. and famotidine, yep. a lot of them will change their gut. So it's taking that into account and trying to balance or counterbalance almost and give, you know, probiotics at the same right. time or give nice sources of fiber that help to support the bugs that are in there that are so important for their everyday life. It takes a team, right? So exactly. It a exactly. Team of approaches. It takes a team of great people. It takes all of that. And that should be a part of our just wellness protocol in general for people and pets, you know? It is. And it's true because we all have certain strengths. So I co-manage a lot of patients with their oncologists, their internal medicine specialists, their dermatologists, their cardiologists, their general practitioners, of course. And it really is having that group approach to promote their wellness. Because at the end of the day, that's all of our goals is we just want to make our pets as happy as we can and have them live a high quality life for as long as as they can. And it takes all of us to do that, including the pet parents, because they are really the biggest piece of that, because even their energy and their moods, and this is something that I don't think a lot of us think about, but our animals are very sensitive and in tune with us. So for a lot of us, especially if we have more sensitive animals, and I think we all know if we do, (laughs) it's really important for us to take care of ourselves because it does affect them. Would that be one piece of advice for pet parents? So one piece of advice is Find a veterinarian that you feel comfortable having open conversations with, because I have met a lot of pet parents that, you know, they have their general practitioner and they've been going to them for years and years. But if you can't have a healthy two-way conversation about some of the things that you're reading about or interested in, that's not going to be a good fit for you anymore. So you need to find someone that maybe they don't know about what you're asking about, but they're open-minded enough to listen to you and hear you out and perhaps give you resources and point you in the right direction. I, I think that that is, it's so essential for pet parents to feel heard. And also they really care and love their animals so much that they will go, you know, Google things and look things up. And I'm not saying everything on there is the best you know, input like thing to bring into their everyday regimen, but some of those things are. And so finding a veterinarian that's open-minded and you can, you feel comfortable talking to is really important and don't feel, don't feel like you cannot advocate for your own pet in a respectful manner, of course, but yeah, advocacy is important. 
Since I started this this conversation talking about the ozone therapy uh, shampoo that you recommended for Chance, I thought we could um, just touch on it. Sure. So ozone is actually an oxygen molecule. So the oxygen that we breathe is O2. Ozone is Mm -hmm. O3. So it's an unstable molecule, but basically it's a gas that's created. And that molecule itself kills viruses, bacteria, fungi, yeast, cancer cells. Mm -hmm. It's actually used to sterilize certain things in an industrial aspect. And so when we use it on a medical side, we're using medical grade oxygen to create this ozone. So that's what differentiates it. The beauty behind it is it doesn't negatively affect the normal healthy cells in our body. It actually increases the energy powerhouse of the cells, which is the mitochondria. And that's its biggest support in terms of recovering from cancer or illness. So ozone therapy has been used a lot in Europe, parts of South America and Asia, literally for decades. There's plenty of research supporting it, but in the U S at least we've been a little bit slower to adopt it. There are definitely holistic practitioners that use it very frequently. I even have some, you know, conventional or standardly trained oncologists that recognize it as an adjunct to their chemotherapy protocols. Um, but it's still, you know, there's a lot of people that question it. So sometimes if you bring it up to your, to your general practitioner, they will not necessarily know how to answer your question about it. But again, the two of you can work together to find someone that does have knowledge, but it's used topically for antiseptic properties or anti-inflammatory products, which is the shampoo. (laughs) So that shampoo (laughs) is working because it's actually an ozonated argon oil. So the oil is the substrate which delivers the ozone to the surface of the skin and then allows all of those wonderful beneficial responses that you've experienced firsthand. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not kidding. Like the yeast on his, his tail, which has we've struggled with for many moons, um, is essentially mm, gone. That makes it's me so crazy happy. Time. I'm so happy. And, you know, the reason behind that is I a lot of the antiseptic shampoos that are out there and are regularly used you know, they're great at killing them off, but they're also not repairing the cells to help necessarily fight yes. against it. There are some components in some of those shans- shampoos that will do that, um, but it's yeah. not commonly seen. And also it's harsh enough that we always have to ask ourselves, you know, what kind of damage this is doing to the healthy cell members. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I think what's happening with just overuse of those medicated shampoos for so long. Exactly. Um, and they were very helpful for a period mm-hmm, of time, for mm-hmm. sure. But I'm just glad that I can find something that um, is really helpful. Good. Him, that I don't feel, I don't feel, that can feel good. Yes, about, you know exactly. I mean? And it's good for yeah. situations where you have infections. And it's also great for situations yeah. just for maintenance, like for dogs like Chance that have ongoing issues. Yeah. Um, and then in yeah. terms of how else to deliver it, you know, topical is an option. You can infuse it into areas. So you can, I can infuse it into ear canals and help with resistant ear infections. Cats that have recurrent urinary tract issues, they'll infuse it into their bladder. Mm. Uh, You can infuse it. One of the most common ways of administering it is what's called rectal insufflation, where you actually give the gas into the end of the rectum or large intestine. And the portal vein, this really large vein that takes blood to the liver is there. And so the ozone gas will go straight into circulation, but because it's so unstable, it starts breaking down right away. So people always wonder, you know, how exactly does that work? And it's, it's getting into the bloodstream so fast, but then it starts mediating its effects from there, but those effects are global. So there's a lot of different delivery methods. You can ozonate fluids. Like I had one patient that had a It was actually a patient that Dr. Heather and I somewhat shared. I would help kind of help her out every so often with that patient. But that dog had a draining tract of this wound that just was draining and draining and Mm. wouldn't respond to antibiotics and had been present for weeks, if not months. And she had the, the client started using ozonated saline to flush it out. And it finally resolved. It completely went away. So there's a place for it. And the other thing we don't have to worry about is resistance, which is a huge issue um, with using any sort of antimicrobial therapy. So this provides an avenue for us to exert as strong of effects, but without the negative consequences of it. Right. Are they using this on people too? They do. Mm -hmm. They do. I'm not sure how frequent that use is in the US, but outside of this country, it is a lot of the studies are in human medicine. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we'll get more information and it'll become more widely known. Exactly. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Lindsay. This has been amazing. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Baru Podcast. I've put the links in the show notes for some of the great things that we talked about today. And please remember that the Baru Podcast is for informational purposes only, even if it features the advice of veterinarians. It is not, nor is it intended to be, a substitute for professional veterinary care. As always, if you enjoyed the episode, please don't forget to rate and follow the Baru wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow on Instagram at Baru Pet. All right, you guys, let's chat next week.